So, good morning, um, this week we are discussing protein ligand and protein protein interactions. Uh, today we have a fourth lecture. So, in the last lecture uh, we discussed various techniques that mostly detected the small molecule ligand in this protein protein interactions. Um, some of the technique that we discussed like STD and MR saturation transfer difference, the water log C looking at the line width and transfer NOE, how these techniques can probe the ligand side and once we find the epitopes we can even create a docked model uh, or complex model um, where because we know from where the ligand uh, like what are the sites on ligand that interacts with the protein. So, those can be used as a restraints to create a complex model. Now, let us go into little more detail and today we will be discussing how you can look at the protein, uh, protein side. So, the other partner which is a bigger molecule protein how we can look at this. And that is what um, last time we summarized a ligand based NMR methods for screening experiment to determine in a qualitative manner STD NMR. We can map the ligand like a ligand epitope mapping and then we can use even if we do multiple concentration like what we discussed is called STD amplification factor. We can do that and we can find it out the dissociation constant in a quantitative manner. Then we also discussed saturation transfer double difference for whole cell binding. So, we ended up here. Now, today we were going to look at the other side that is protein based method. So, we can classify this ligand protein interaction into two ligand based method. Again it relies on knowledge of property of ligand a small molecule typically. Uh, then we can look at the chemical shift perturbation, the relaxation that we already discussed and change in their resonance position and also how they are diffusing. So, diffusion coefficient upon binding the small molecule will diffuse differently than whenever it is free. So, all those we had already finished it. So, th all these are done. Now, protein based method basically we are now looking at a bigger molecule protein right. So, uh, we need to have a knowledge of a protein, how, what is the structure of this, what is the function of this protein. So, structural functional aspects of protein should be known when we are using this for a protein based method. Now, actually the deterministic uh, um, signal that comes from protein is chemical shift change, change in the chemical shift. So, we can do SAR uh, by NMR monitoring how chemical shift is changing and typically for doing this 2D heteronuclear single quantum coherence is used, 2D heteronuclear single quantum coherence is used right where, uh, where each peak gives an idea of one of the correlation like if you are putting it 15 N and proton correlation. So, that means each peak which is here is reporting about one amino acid. And the changes that happens in these amino acids essentially can be captured when we do protein based NMR methods. Right. So, what we can look at a protein detected experiments. So, you need to first stably like a, a label this with a stable isotope and here our ligand can be unlabeled. So, protein has to be labeled because now we are looking at the protein and since protein molecules are big, big. So, to get resolution to understand more in details because now we want to go go and uh, go to get residue specific information. So, we need to uh, enhance the resolution by isotopically label these proteins. However, our ligand can be unlabeled. So, what we are going to monitor here is a chemical shift. Now, chemical shift of a protein actually may change upon binding or intensity may change upon binding. So, one of these parameter we are going to monitor. So, the change in the chemical shift change that the, the chemical environment of that particular nuclei is changing and that basically can report about what is the on rate of binding, what is the off rate of binding, what is the Kex exchange chemical exchange phenomena and using that actually one can get the Kd of, of the binding right ligand protein binding. Then we can even find it out 
the binding site on the structure where from where the chemical shift is changing, what are the residues that are engaged in this interaction that, that is going to tell us about binding, uh, binding site mapping. We are going to discuss this in detail. Then the other parameter that we can monitor. So, if you remember in the last class I, I just on the basis of bonding I showed that here is one parameter called chemical shift, another parameter called intensity and third parameter is called say lambda line width. These three are easily determine, uh, determine like we can determine these parameters easily. So, chemical shift tells about the chemical environment, intensity tells about how many like uh, what is the population that is being participated in these. So, intensity also can tell you about binding uh, site mapping on this structure and using this of course, one can get it k on, k off, k exchange and kd. The third parameter is line width right. So, line width depends upon T2 uh, the transverse relaxation rate and if the molecule becomes bigger and bigger your line width changes and that also tells about this this changes. So, for a unligated you have a sharp line once it binds you go to a broad line. So, that generally the it may go depending upon how binding is happening you go to uh, go and get the broad line and that also tells about the binding phenomena. Then we will be also discussing some of these um, other techniques like a CPMG techniques that essentially is used for determining the lowly populated state uh, in the protein ligand interaction or even protein conformational change and ZZ, ZZ exchange we are going to discuss both of these. So, essentially depending upon uh, what we want to probe, so CPMG actually probes the exchange between two states and if they are slowly exchanging then ZZ um, exchange can be probed. So, briefly we are going to discuss these two techniques in coming slide. Okay. So, let us start, let us start from the beginning. So, as we said if we are looking at the protein we need to have some structure functional information of, of a protein and just to recapitulate what we have, we have done recap. Of, of the uh, steps involved in protein structure determination by NMR. So, essentially what we are doing? We are going from primary sequence to three dimensional structure and what are the steps involved in doing this? First you have to prepare the sample. Now, our sample has to be isotopically labeled. So, you feed your bacteria with ammonium chloride and carbon 13 glucose and or or like you can be singly labeled only ammonium chloride and our ammonium sulphate or for doubly level your glucose also has to be 13 C level. So, once we prepare the sample we can go and collect the data multi dimensional data right. So, multi dimensional data will be collected. Now, since this is our say data right uh, coming in the background also I have a data. So, we collected data. Next step to identify what is this peak, what is this peak, what is this peak. So, all these peaks identification is called resonance assignment. So, you have to analyze this data. Now, we have a name for this these peaks it can be some L, M, N whatever uh, amino acids right. So, and for a structure determination you have to generate a resistance. So, distance resistance, angular resistance and all those you have to generate which we have already discussed and then you calculate this structure three dimensional structure using these resistance angular resistance the, the bond vector resistance. <coughs> and, and the distance resistance and finally, we incorporate all these resistance for a structure calculation, we determine the structure and finally, we validate this structure what is the quality of the structure. So, once we have a structure we are all set to understand how this protein is interacting with another protein or another ligand and that we can now we are going to use this information which we have captured here during the structure determination of a protein. So, just to, to summarize suppose I have a protein which we, we are working in our lab say SKP1, S phase kinase protein some, some protein which is involved in uh, ubiquitination. So, you be like a, it is one of the component in E3 ligase. So, do not go in technical details. So, first you have to purify this protein right. So, you have to be um, getting the exact molecular weight. So, you can do either SDS page you should have a single band of these proteins 
then you can validate using MALDI techniques. So, you are getting the exact molecular weight this is m by 2. So, you are you are sure that my protein is absolutely pure and this protein sample that we, we are preparing is at least N15 level. We also determine the secondary structure using one of the low resolution structural technique like circular dichroism. So, one can see here it is showing helical characteristic and you can see here lots of heli, heli, helices are there. So, now this corroborates that the structure which, which, which should be captured is showing helical. Then we recorded the HSQC spectrum using various sets of 3D experiment that you have already done. One can assign each of these peaks. And so, you each peaks has a name right. So, this is say V25, this is K113, uh, uh, this is say A52. So, now we have, now once we do titration experiment or the binding experiment, the any perturbation you see here can be captured and that perturbation is essentially used to understand protein ligand or protein protein interactions that is that is how we are going to do now. So, suppose this my favorite protein SKP1 is binding to its partner called SKP2 and binding site is here. So, what do we expect right from theoretical knowledge? So, this blue is SKP1 and this uh, this this the um, orange color is SKP2 and binding site here is shown in red. So, suppose we are studying this protein right we are doing the titration of the experiment. So, we assume uh, we, we are saying that there will be some change in the chemical shift. So, to start with what we are doing we are taking the labeled SKP1, we are monitoring on SKP1 and then we are taking unlabeled SKP2, we are titrating it and seeing what is changing. So, suppose change is happening, so I have taken here 2 residue uh, here in this plot and here also 2 residue. If you see one residue is very less changing, something is happening that we are going to discuss little more detail. So, intensity is changing, but here you can see it is a chemical shift is changing. In this case also this guy is not changing A6 and say a some name like A6 uh, it can be from other protein. So, some, some amino acid is not changing and here one amino acid changing very nicely if you look at if we are titrating it adding more unlabeled SKP2 peaks changes. So, now change in the peak at least is telling that some interaction is happening right some interaction is happening and now that is what we are going to monitor. So, chemical shift is absorbed for the various species uh, and those are the powerful probe to understand the binding interaction. So, we have taken the labeled one partner, the unlabeled another partner, we are titrating it, adding and we are maintaining some stoichiometry ratio for each titration. We are monitoring what is happening in each peak and a peak wise manner we are going to, to assign and understand the point of our interaction on the protein side. Great. So, as we saw there are there are certain phenomena happening peak is shifting or peak can appear appear at a different position or it can disappear. So, now appearance or disappearance of this individual peak that means change in the intensity or line width can vary and that needs to be quantified for finding it out actual binding effect and that depends upon several property right several property of these interactions. So, let us take it some of the parameter which will help us in understanding the protein 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 ligand interaction. So, suppose we have a free protein which we define as a P it has concentration of P now uh, or a characteristic P and a free ligand which is L and a complex which is forming P L. So, for a free protein there is a chemical shift right which is omega P and when pro and you remember what we are looking at only protein right ligand is unlabeled. So, when protein forms a complex which is P L now its chemical shift is changing from omega P to omega P L right. So, the change in the chemical shift that we are monitoring is delta omega that is happening because of this interactions. So, we can say omega P minus omega L so, to make it more understandable here is my omega P and it has shifted and made it something like omega P L. So, this difference that we are seeing omega P 
minus omega PL is delta omega. So, change in the chemical shift of this protein which is labeled is delta P. Okay. So, upon this interaction we are getting this parameter. Now, the appearance of different species of protein in the NMR actually varies. Um, it, it also depends upon what is the concentration we are choosing of various species protein to ligand test stoichiometry. It depends upon what is the, the rate with which they are associating, what is the rate which we are they are dissociating. So, KD is one of the important and what is the exchange between them. So, how, how these two para like two protein bound and free form is exchanging between them. So, K exchange in next slide I am going to or next couple of slide I am going to discuss in little more detail. So, let us define this K exchange parameter. K exchange parameter is K on into ratio of ligand and plus K off. So, <coughs> one can determine subpopulation of free protein one can get it K off divided by K on into ligand concentration plus K off and bound conformation can be P like a population of PL K on ligand concentration divided by K on L plus K off. So, uh, if we know the ligand concentration, if we know the rate and population, we can find it out how, what is the free population, what is the bound population. So, by getting these uh, chemical shift and ligand concentration, we can also get the population which is in bound form, which is in free form and various thermodynamic parameter. So, you can see now we are now going little more detail in a quantitative manner of, of binding uh, in terms of thermodynamics, in terms of kinetics. So, as, as I will mentioned, one of the parameter that we were discussing is Kx. So, chemical exchange this is called. So, two or more state, right, during the time of recording of NMR, how they are changing that is called exchange phenomena. Suppose this is my protein cartoon we have made and this protein is changing its conformation right here, it is a change in the conformation. So, <coughs> the rate with which the exchange between one conformation to another conformation when we are recording the NMR spectrum that is called chemical exchange. So, typically on the ten NMR time scale this K exchange may vary, it can be fast, it can be slow or it can be intermediate. So, depending upon what is the um, magnitude of K x. So, chemical exchange typically can be slow if the two states are slowly exchanging with each other. What is the slow? With respect to NMR time scale, again I am going to explain you what is the NMR time scale. Mm, because we are recording the spectrum. So, when they are exchanging slowly, so we can probably get the two peaks, one coming from state A, say state A and one coming from state B, if they are exchanging very slowly. The another phenomena can be <coughs> intermediate time scale, it is neither fast nor slow. So, like, a, like you see fan, if fan is rotating very slow, very, very slow, you can see all three wings, right? If it is with some speed, they are like a, they are uh, with some speed they are spinning, where your eye cannot resolve it. But you see an average, right? Average uh, state of these. So that we can call is intermediate states. So where the contribution from A and B are so merged that we are unable to distinguish. And then there is a fast exchange with respect to NMR time scale. So, then you see an average state, right? If fan is spinning very fast, you see an average a, average value of these three wings or average phenomena of these three wings. So, that is a fast exchange. So, at the NMR time scale, the exchange between the two states can be slow, fast, or intermediate, and that based on the magnitude of Kx. Right, so, what is the NMR time scale and uh, that, that we are talking and exchange rates. So, when we are probing and say protein ligand interaction using a standard either one dimensional proton NMR or 2D NMR spectrum that is what we are going to do. So, for labeled protein we typically record this HSQC, but you can use also 1D NMR that we had discussed earlier. Right, so, what is the lifetime of say bound state and free state, how these say bound state or P state and PL state how they are exchanging and 
<coughs> so the lifetime of bound state and T is uh, free state is tau uh, and then it depends how accurately we can determine the resonance frequency of this P state and PL state respectively. So that is given by the lifetime of these states and that is say delta omega. So the change in like a difference in the resonance frequency of omega P minus omega PL is our delta omega and that is correlated with this Planck's constant with the lifetime of, of these two states. How um, what is the lifetime of bound state or, or free state? So delta omega is the difference in the resonance frequency for these two peaks. So k exchange that is per second will be given by the lifetime of this 1 by tau and that will be respect to this uh, delta omega that is in radian per second. So if the lifetime of two state is very short, very short then the difference in the resonance frequency cannot be measured right. So that is that is they, they will collapse to a measured signal. So, if the lifetime of these two state is very short, so like they are so short they are exchanging very fast. So, you cannot measure it right? at the NMR time scale it will be unmeasurable you get a collapsed state. But if they are slowly exchanging the lifetime is quite long you can measure it right. So, that is what uh, happens in slow intermediate and fast exchange. So, when an exchange rate is much slower then the observed difference in the resonance frequency the exchange rate is, is said to be slow on the NMR time scale right on the NMR time scale. So, here is a protein and here is a ligand right. So, they are slowly exchanging. So, K e x one can have which is 1 per second to 10 per second you can see in slow exchange depending upon what is the KD, K off rate and all those we are seeing 2 peaks clearly 2 peaks. One peak coming from the free protein, one peak coming from the protein in complex with a ligand. 2 peaks we are getting so our K exchange is much slower than the delta omega change in the, the difference in the chemical shift of these 2. And uh, even in 2D you can measure so we are getting clearly 2 peaks one coming from the free protein, one coming from the protein complexes which is here ok. So, now this is called the slow exchange where K e x is much less than delta omega the difference in the chemical shift of these two states. The another one which is called say intermediate time scale uh, regime where our K e x K exchange will be roughly equal to the change uh, difference in the chemical shift of P and L. So, here suppose uh, this is for P and this is for L. So, you can see now lines are getting broader and exchange rate between this. So, here line is going down here lines are coming up here also you see uh, the lines are getting broader and lines is shifting. So, depending upon what is the even in the intermediate regime what is the uh, exchange between these two you see peaks is slowly shifting and disappearing that is the intermediate time scale. So, as we were giving analogy of fan if it is speed uh, spins so that we cannot differentiate between these two states our I cannot resolve it that is what is the intermediate state, uh, state K exchange. So, here the difference in the frequency will be equal to Kx, Kx of the uh, of two states. <coughs> now, coming to the fast exchange. This is the regime where our K exchange the exchange between the, these two states omega P and omega PL is very fast happening very fast happening. So, K exchange is much much faster than delta omega of these two. So, these two states are closer but peaks gradually shift to a new position and we, we have a average value that we see. So, this is fast exchange happening very very fast ok. So, these these two these like uh, these two concepts uh, these few concepts of slow exchange intermediate exchange and fast exchange are measured in terms of what is the difference in the resonance frequency of these two states at the NMR time scale with respect to NMR time scale and that is basically used in the NMR. So, here one can see 
now in the fast exchange regime our peak is moving from one position to another position. Great, so now coming back to how, how we can use this. So, suppose if in fast exchange regime the chemical shift in the either dimension either of two dimension proton and nitrogen uh, can shift either proton can shift from one position to another position nitrogen can shift to one, one position to another position. So, in that case one has to take the change in the chemical shift combination. Now, how do you normalize because now proton chemical shift varies from 0 to 10 and this can vary about 30 ppm in pro protein like 100 to 130. So, you have a normalization factor that comes from the gyromagnetic ratio. So, you can measure it delta 8 combined will be change in the uh, chemical shift frequency of proton square plus 0.1 which is coming from the ratio of gyromagnetic, uh, gyromagnetic ratio 0.1 multiplied with the change in the resonance frequency of nitrogen the square it take under root that is a combination. You can see fast exchange since proton and here proton and nitrogen both axis are moving. So, in those case you can find it out how much chemical shift is changing. Great, so we, we, we find it out I will just show you one example of non-covalent binding of two proteins. So, here um, in my lab one of my PhD student titrated N15 labeled sumo with its binding partner called E2 and he find he found some of the peaks were, were shifting little bit, some of the peaks were disappearing. So, he quantified it and looking at these values since peaks were disappearing more, so we are knowing that this is happening at the intermediate time scale, it is not a fast time scale. To substantiate that he did also ITC experiment that I explained you in the previous class, this is a thermodynamic parameter uh, experiment that measures the various thermodynamic parameter and one can see here uh, when we titrate sumo with its binding partner called E2, we are getting a typical KD of 2.5 um, micromolar and looking at this peak disappearance, few of the peaks you can see here either shifting or disappearance, we are knowing that this is happening in intermediate time scale. So, these two, two uh, techniques are collaborating very well, KD at a lower micromolar range and peak disappearance happening in the NMR, one can say that the exchange between the bound form and a complex form of N15 level sumo was at intermediate time scale. So, we found it out not only the position where it interacts, the order of magnitude of the interaction also one can find it out. Now, um, Another example I am showing you, here is another protein which interacts with one of the metal ions. So, we titrated with metal ion and what you are seeing here, few of the peaks just zoom it here. Like here we have A119, you can see nicely the peaks are shifting here, 120 peaks are shifting here. So, these peaks were shifting and they are telling that these are the residue that are involved in the interactions. So, you can map those interacting site on this structure. Now, you know where this metal is binding. So, not only you got the thermodynamic parameter by fitting it, um, which I am going to explain in the next class, how you fit this change in the chemical shift to get an idea of exact binding constant, but also we got the location where actually it binds. So, you can map those on the structure and find it out exactly the binding site. So, that is what NMR offers you not only the, the, the position of the binding, but also it also offers the, the thermodynamic parameter. Here qualitatively I told you what will be the order of magnitude. Next class I am going to explain in a more quantitative manner how we can use these to find it out what is happening. So, there are like uh, that is I will uh, stop it here and in the next class we are going to discuss two advanced technique which is used for understanding the protein protein interaction is called CPMG and ZZ, ZZ exchange that captures es essentially the intermediate scale exchange like a micromolar exchange and a slow exchange that we are going to discuss it. And then uh, looking at some of the quantitative aspects of interactions, uh, these interactions, how we can determine the parameter. So, um, hope to see you in the next class. Thank you very much for your atten attention. Thank you.